Welcome to F3 on 4 and the second round of the new Power Tour package of motorsport entertainment that includes the British Formula 3s, GTs and National Saloons. We're up in the North East for the first time this year at Croft near Darlington, but the season actually started at the opposite end of the country and John Cleland's going to take a look at the highlights of round one. The Formula 3 circus went through the whole of 1999 without a single wet race. At Thruxton this year, it was immensely wet. That didn't stop two drivers trying to race on slick tyres. They retired, Stato and Collins, as they aquaplaned off the circuit using slick tyres. That's why we have groove tyres. The grooves allow the water to move off the tyre and give good rubber contact with the surface. Now, a wet lap is only about 10% slower than a dry lap. Of course, the other problem in the wet is visibility, which makes running close to the car in front almost impossible and makes it very difficult for overtaking. Formula 3 cars have high intensity rear lights, just like Grand Prix. However, it's still possible to be caught out diving into the spray of another car. Antonio Pizzoni nearly lost his maiden victory at Thruxton as he came upon the struggling Takuma Stato at Alar. Despite the rain, we did get a couple of good overtaking opportunities at the chicane under braking. However, all the moves didn't work. Wesley Barber's overtaking manoeuvre on his own teammate went all wrong, and somehow he got away without a penalty. But the most significant clash was when Gary Paffitt went to go around the outside of Michael Bentwood on the last lap. Paffitt turned in, Bentwood turned in. We have the inevitable collision. Bentwood stalled, Paffitt survived. Bentwood was well put out. One of the features of Formula 3 over the last few years has been the struggle Martin O'Connell has had trying to compete without sufficient funds. Last year, this meant driving an older class B car in the national class and hoping that he could find a sponsor who'd help him move up into the championship class and all the latest technology. Well, this year, two things have changed. Martin's found himself a healthy budget and the national class has had a facelift. Martin Haven explains. Motor racing is always banging on about bringing on new talent, but the business does recognise how hard it is to get together a proper budget to race at the top level. Hence, the national class, running alongside championship class in Formula 3. The drivers were forced to use older cars, reckoned to be slower, so they wouldn't embarrassingly beat the newer ones, but available second-hand from the top teams at a reasonable price. You do a full season cheaply, but in among the established talent and in front of the top team managers, so they can pluck you out of the shadows on your way to stardom. Well, it almost worked like that, but this year it ought to, because the BRDC have made some changes. They first of all changed the name to the scholarship class, and they've offered a bursary of £125,000 for the winner to be put towards a championship class seat for next year. The man behind this is Chris Norman. The BRDC has got a record of supporting young drivers um, at various stages of their career in an attempt to find the next Jensen Button um, and the next crop of Formula One drivers. And Formula Three is the ideal learning curve for that. And what we're trying to do is encourage drivers from Formula Ford, from Loreno, to make that step up, scholarship class the first year, championship class the second year, and really be in with the chance of the title. Now this year, the title favourite is Gary Paffitt, and he's already in receipt of BRDC largesse through the McLaren Autosport Award that they co-sponsor. It's great for them to be supporting young drivers. They've, it's becoming more and more expensive to, uh, to compete in motorsport, and it's just been hard and hard to find the money, and they've supported me and a lot of other drivers this year, and I hope we can continue to, to win this class maybe this year and get more money out of them. <laughs> So what does Martin O'Connell think of these changes that have come just a year too late for him to benefit? I think the new award's great for the championship. It's brought in a lot of new talent. Um, people like Gary Paffitt that are, are needed in this championship to keep it going. It, it makes the grid into a full-size grid and, and makes two races of it, which is much better for the spectators. Croft is one of the newest circuits on the F3 calendar. At least it was heavily modified recently. And on the first lap, they're all barreling down pit straight into turn one at Clairvaux, 
and then through here into this bottleneck at Hawthorns. Now, it's almost inevitable that there's going to be some contact because this is one of the trickiest parts of the circuit. Ask Warren Carraway from last year. He barrel rolled here, and he fortunately got away without hurting himself. If you get round there safely, the best opportunity for overtaking is to exit Hawthorns as quickly as you can, just belt the chicane, more or less flat out, and try to outbreak the guy down the inside into tower. Now, there's always going to be overtaking opportunities there in the race. Otherwise, you're going to have a crack at the final hairpin. The tightest corner in the circuit, the tightest hairpin in the country, and the last corner of the lap. You stay out to the right, stay wide, but this leaves the inside open so someone can dive down the inside and overtake. Just don't run into the car in front, like Christian Colby did last year, taking out Andrew Kakodi, spinning off and stalling and costing fourth place in the race. Not a popular move. And so to qualifying. Overtaking in the race is never easy, whether it be in the wet like at Thruxton or on a day like today, so starting at the front is a huge advantage. Now the only way to ensure that is to go fastest in qualifying. Now the second session's about to begin and Martin Haven's going to pick out the winners and losers now that it really counts. The surprise of the first qualifying session was the pace of the RC Benetton team, Nicholas Chiesa sitting on top of the pile for much of the session. Back place was second though, uh, I was pole for a long time but I think uh, the next qualifying I'll, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can snatch pole because my fifth gear broke in this session at the end so when it was due to do the best times uh, I couldn't do it. His time was beaten by Antonio Pizzonia, series favourite and race one winner. Big losers in the morning, the Promotechni Renault team. Andy Prio and Matt Davis struggled in 11th and 12th positions, and team boss Serge Saunier was giving nothing away as to the cause. Was it an engine problem or, or gears or setup of the car? We don't know yet. Uh, we have to wait uh, and then look uh, on, the, on the data. But surely the drivers must have given you some indication as to where the problem was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They gave us uh, already some indication. But you're not going to tell me? No, sorry. The afternoon session proved no better. Davis slipped back to 14th, Prio advanced only up to 10th. At the front, the pattern was similar. Young Brazilian Pizzonia unable to match Dane Chiesa until near the end. But the reigning British Formula Ford champion then pulled out all the stops to take pole. A big leap forward for the Italian team. Quite happy uh, because of uh, it's only our second race. The team's never been in England, so it's quite an achievement for both me and the team. Uh, Quite happy to uh, also to have the pole position here because it's, uh, it's only my second race. So it's quite happy with that. Behind them, Takuma Sato strung three quick laps together at the end of the afternoon session to take third place for Carlin Motorsport. The track condition is slightly better than this morning, and um, but we had already two sets of new tyre in this morning, so very hard to improve. But we had a uh, make change the car and um, it works well. The young Japanese relegated the Stewart team to fourth and fifth under the watchful gaze of Foss Jackie. A rumour going round suggested Grand Prix test driver Luciano Berti, last year's F3 runner-up, was soon going to replace Johnny Herbert at Jaguar. I heard it this morning from Murray Walker, uh, so therefore I don't know, and I read something about it today in the Telegraph as well. Uh, there's no truth in any discussion. We've never had discussions within the team yet with regards to any suggestion of that kind. A maiden pole position then for Nicholas Chiesa and the Benetton team ahead of Antonio Pizzonia. The Stewart pair in fourth and fifth, the only team to get two cars into the top half dozen in qualifying. Gary Paffett takes his second pole in the scholarship class. He'll start in 15th on the grid ahead of the Meritus pair, Katsumata and Marcel Romano in his first race. OK, so it's all about to start, but before it does, we'll take a quick break. Join us again in a couple of minutes in F3 on 4. Welcome back to F3 on 4 and the second round of the green flag British Formula 3 Championship. You can hear the cars revving as they're on the grid, about to start the race, so we'll go to Martin Haven. Waiting for the lights with Antonio Pizzonia, second on the grid, the five second ball is given, the revs rise, the tension mounts, the red lights come on. 
They're green. Round two is underway, and Chiesa stalls, stops on the grid. He gets it rolling, but that pole position advantage long gone as he swamped Tony Elites from Carthagena up from fifth place on the grid into Clervo and down to Hawthorns for the first time. And this will be crunch time for the men in the field. Can they all get through? Bit of dust at the back. It looks like they're all safely through. And down there is Sato, Takuma Sato, right down the order, riding with him now. Should have been in third place, running down to the first corner. That's Chiesa on his right as he follows Wesley Barber, passing the pole position man and going down the inside, just as John Clennon suggested. Gets by him. Can he hold it together? Stays off the dirt on the outside, but Wesley Barber takes the place back. Through the Jim Clark S's, Pitsonia, Carthage, Kane, and then the Fortec pair, Michael Beckwith, Jan Maria Bruni, then Milos Pavlovich in the best of the RC Benetton cars as the Ace continues his route backwards through the traffic. Towards the end of the first lap, Pitsonia leading from Karthik A and Bentwood in third, and then Bruni under pressure for fourth place. Trying to go around the outside was Pavlovich, but he's lost a place to the white Stewart, and that is Thomas Schechter recovering from another bad start. Prio, the best of the Renaults, trying to go around Pavlovich as he goes wide. Lock up there from Takuma Sato, trying to get past the dark blue car of Wesley Barber. He's lining him up now as they come onto the straight. Let's ride with him. Jinx to the left, dives to the right then. He's sold Barber the dummy. He's got the inside line for Clervo. Under braking, takes the position. Very classical racing move there. Made the space and used it. But he's much further back than he should have been. And this is why the start replayed with Jan Maria Bruni. Red lights on, green lights on. Look for the slow starters. There's Schenter, there's Sato, there's Chiesa. And now coming past... There is Michael Bentwood, who started behind, but got an even better run down into the first corner. And that's Warren Carway, another disastrous trip to Croft. He's OK, but the car is damaged. Don't forget, he flipped here last year. 13th at Thruxton, retires here. Bad start to his season. Good start for Pitsonia, though. One at Thruxton, leading here from Carthage and from Bentwood, from Bruni, Schechter, Pavlovich, Frio, Sato, then Wesley Barber. Chiesa, the pole man, right the way down there in 10th place. Dreadful start for him has really ruined his race. Leaders starting to spread out a little bit, but Bruni under pressure for fourth. Schechter dives down the inside into tower. Will he hold it together on the exit? Runs very wide, uses all the curb. Bruni looking to come back again, but yellow flags ahead. That's for Warren Carway's accident, so he can't line Schechter up for a pass there. So Schechter is fourth, Bruni is fifth. Now he's got a chance to uh, fight back, but Schechter is already ahead of him. Well, just as John Clellan suggested, Tower being a very good passing opportunity, Jan Maria Bruni, or Jimmy to his friends, comes over to the grass to take the classic racing line. Schechter seizes the opportunity, dives in very deep, and just holds it together. Torch rear Charfnan in the pits, punctured left rear tyre being changed. Alan Docking gets him to start up and head back out again. Chiesa now trying to pick up a place right behind Takuma Sato. Running very wide out of tower, trying to line him up. Looks like Pavlovich's teammate is holding up this queue of cars. Prio can't make a move, but Sato at the back is under pressure from Chiesa. There is the pole man angling around the back of the Japanese. Takes a tight line, he's running wide. And look, oh my goodness, he's off! And he can't stop it. Off into the tyres he goes, and that is the end of a promising weekend for the young Dane. What a shame. Q behind Pavlovich is getting longer. Now Prio, Sato have been joined by Barber and Davis, who's in 10th place in the second Renault engine car. A five-car train, and they're all being held up by Pavlovich in the lead machine. Sato now chasing the cars ahead of him, but let's have a look again at what happened to Chiesa. Tight at the apex, runs out wide, hoping to get a better speed out of the corner, but once he's on that wet grass, it may as well be sheet ice, and he's heavily off into the barriers. Gary Pappett not up among the front runners as he was at Thruxton, but still leading the scholarship class comfortably. And out front, leading the race, Antonio Pizzonia, building the sort of advantage that he had at Thruxton as well. Here we are now, riding with the Brazilian. Fifth, sixth gear, the flat-out Jim Clark S is, ooh, scary stuff. Flat again through the right hander at Barcroft. Don't try this in your Toka simulator. Down into fourth for Sunny in. Change of gear up into fifth for Sunny out, and then into sixth gear again, top speed down the straight. Well, he makes it look very easy, doesn't he? But it's very, very edge of the seat stuff. Big battle continues. Wesley Barber ninth, Sato ahead, Matt Davis behind him in tenth, and here's Carthage in second place. 
and anxious to do well in front of team boss Jackie Stewart. His engineers watching the race times on the monitors, but the drivers can do that as well, courtesy of fancy onboard electronics like Takuma Sato's wheel come dashboard. Speed being shown on the top line, and as he comes across the line, there's his lap time, 115.54, and it's lap 13. Well, his pace, probably like everybody else's in this group, being dictated by Pavlovich at the front of it. But Sato trying his best to make a move, struggling over the bumps. Look at him fight the wheel there, through the chicane, down to tower, speed climbing to 140 miles an hour here as the blue lights come on to tell him when he's over revving it. On the radio to the team as well, down to fourth. Through we go, exiting tower over the rumble strips and then accelerating up through the gearbox towards the S's, getting closer and closer. Warren Carway watching there, reflecting maybe on what might have been as Sato now, looking down the inside into Sunny. Prio's got that one covered, no chance, little lockup from the Japanese. Again, the gear change lights telling him when he should be going up the gears for maximum power. So Sato drops back a little bit and Wesley Barber now under pressure from Matt Davis. Davis at the back of the queue, doesn't have to worry about who's behind him yet. But if he doesn't hurry up and get past Barber, he will lux down the inside at the hairpin. There's John Clements, other overtaking opportunity, ideally indicated there by Matt Davis. Very tight line, very hard to defend against that unless you want to turn in and make a crash. But look how hard Barber is pressing him all the way down to Clairvaux, trying desperately to force an inside line. Matt Davis, having finally got past, was having none of that. They have dropped right back, though. And Martin O'Connell is now right on the tail of Wesley Barber. Well, let's have a look again. Takuma Sato lining up Andy Frio. Doesn't have the room for it there. Locks up, drops back a bit. Maybe that's holding Wesley Barber up as well as they run up to the hairpin. And that's why Davis could make his move. Fitzonia leads now past the lapped Mark Mail. Karthikeyan some five seconds. Oh, my goodness! Well, Karthikeyan, five seconds behind, but now into the gravel and out of the race. What a disaster for the Indian driver. Thrown away a comfortable second place. Any impression he's made on Jackie Stewart today should not be a favourable one. Well, he's unharmed, climbs out of the car, but he'd better think of a good excuse before he gets back to the pits. Chiesa in the pits, he's out. Look at this, Schechter making a move on Michael Bentwood again at Tower, his favourite place. That's for second. Bentwood held the place for less than half a lap. Well, they're all starting to drop by the wayside now. Let's have a look again at what happened to Carthy Kay, and he shakes his head in disgust. Well, under braking, the car gets away from him. The back comes round. Maybe some brake balance problem. Didn't seem to have locked the fronts up at all. The leader now in amongst the scholarship class. Just gone by Ryan Walker, Philip Hopkins ahead of him, waves him through in a very gentlemanly manner. Of course, those guys all in their own private battle in that scholarship class. Pipsonia leading comfortably overall. Well, the man who started on the outside of the front row leads the race. Amanda is with Nicholas Chiesa, the pole man. After your great performance yesterday in qualifying, what happened at the start? Uh, I let the clutch out too quick, so the car stalled in the start. I managed to get it started again and recover to 10. Drove back to nine, but I was having problems with the handling of the car, and I just overcooked it and uh, went off. And that's Matt Davis. He's almost stationary on the track, just rolling. Something is broken. He pulls over to the left-hand side. That'll allow him to run back into the pits. Well, his race is over. The Renault Day not getting any better for him or for Andy Frio. Just touching Milos Pavlovich up the back there as they get very close together, running into the chicane, riding with Takuma Sato trying desperately to get the power on, fish tailing out of the corner, now he's lining up Andy Frio down the inside, well he's close to the pit wall but that will give him the outside line under braking, he's got the momentum though that carries him into Clairvaux ahead, well taken, opportunist move by Sato, great racing head on that young man's shoulders, ditto this man, Antonio Pizzonia driving away from the opposition, that surely is the best way to win, Sato now at the head of this queue behind Pavlovich, Pavlovich, Sato, then Frio, then Wesley Barber, still stuck at the back of the group. Again with the Japanese driver. Let's see what he can do about the Yugoslav. Oh, he's hit him! 
closing very fast indeed. He just touches him up the back, unsettles Pavlovich. Now Sato sees the Yugoslav run wide and he takes the place away. Well, he was catching him so quickly there after coming flat out through the Jim Clark S's. Oh my goodness me, and another of Ray Rowan's cars has gone off heavily into the barriers. That is Martin O'Connell, and he is disgusted with himself. Wesley Barber at the hairpin. Inside Andy Frio, Sir Saunier's day is getting worse and worse. The Renault Promotechni team driver drops down the order. And here's Martin O'Connell. He got caught out in that Barber and Frio scramble, and he went off at high speed. And here's Prio under pressure now from Ben Collins as Wesley Barber's in seventh ahead and trying to drive away from him. Matt Davis walking back to the pits. The team have reported that he had an engine problem, apparently. The clock is running down towards its 30-minute cutoff point for the race, and Antonio Pizzonia, as he comes across the line, this time will start his final lap, the 24th lap of the race. Well, it's still not in the bag, but P1, one lap to go, plus 5.4 seconds is good news for him. Bad news for Ray Rowan, O'Connell and Carway walking dejectedly back in, and it looks as though Colombo's car won't finish either. Well, Pizzonia with a comfortable margin, enough to slow the pace a little bit and allow Schechter to close. It's about a four and a half second gap, but that's a lifetime as Antonio Pizzonia takes his second win from two starts, the Mano Motorsport team just as delighted as their young Brazilian charge. And back at the complex, the midfield battle. Barber attacking Pavlovich. He's got Frio behind. Collins on the outside, almost locking wheels, the three of them. Collins gets a great run out of the hairpin to grab eighth place on the line. Frio slips back down to ninth. Well, Pintonia the victor then from Schechter and Bentwood, Bruni in fourth place, Sato and Pavlovich, the rest of the top six point scorers. Papit wins the scholarship class from Katsumata, Fleming, Hopkins, Walker and Romanio. Yes, I'm really, really happy, I think, to win two wins in a row in the Formula 3 Championship as a newcomer. I'm really happy, really happy. I need to get a pole and get it off the line properly. I mean, both my starts have been terrible. I think if I can get it off the line, I'll be all right in the race. It wasn't a bad race. We were up there with a lot of the championship class cars, and I had an off here at Sunny Inn, um, went off the circuit, got back on, still in the lead of the class, and I thought just to sit back for a bit and not try too hard because we've got a championship to win. Antonio Pizzonia leads the championship by eight points from Thomas Schechter, who again got the point for fastest lap. Jimmy Bruni third, ahead of Karthikeyan, Bentwood and Pavlovich. And in the scholarship class, Gary Papett leads with the perfect score of 42. Ladies and gentlemen, the top three from the green flag when he formed the three championship. Antonio Pizzonia, Thomas Schechter and Michael Bentwood along with the scholarship class winner, Gary Papett, the campaign to be great. Well, it looks like Antonio Pizzonia has earmarked this championship for himself. John, what do you think? Well, it's a bit early in the season to see yet, but he's certainly stamping his authority on it. And what about Nicholas Gieza? Yeah, unfortunately, he very nearly stalled in the lane. He's proved he's quick. He's certainly a championship contender, but I'm sure he'll get his starts right before the end of the season. Well, the next round's going to be at Alton Park, and that's on Springbank Holiday. But you can see all the action here in F3 on 4. Now, F3 on 4 returns without Springbank holiday action in two weeks at the earlier time of 11 o'clock.